Blue Origin is a space company unlike any other. At first glance of the launch industry, you see three kinds of players. The old guard, industry titans who have vast resources and political connections, and have experience dating back to the dawn of spaceflight. Then you have your startups, cash-strapped young companies betting on bold technologies to make their small sat launcher stand out from the crowd. The third is basically SpaceX, which was one of these new startups that actually made it big time. SpaceX used to be pretty cash-strapped, but of course now, it's not only successful, but owned by the second richest man on Earth. SpaceX is a company based around a vision. They were created to achieve a goal, making humans a multiplanetary species. What makes Blue Origin so unique is that they don't fit precisely into any of these categories. Founded by the richest man on Earth, they have the resources and political connections of the old guard, but without the decades of experience. They're betting on new technologies such as reusability, but they're not strapped for cash or making a small sat launcher. And they are founded to achieve a vision, to build a future where millions of people are living and working in space to benefit Earth. From the outside, this unique position seems incredibly advantageous, coupled with the fact that their founder, Jeff Bezos, oversaw the meteoric rise of Amazon. Blue Origin seemed poised to take the launch industry by storm. But as the years have passed, precious little has been accomplished by Blue, while the competition has raced ahead. Today, I want to take a look at Blue Origin and try to break down what has gone right and what's gone wrong. Before we get started, I have some exciting announcements to make. To celebrate 10,000 subscribers, I wanted to take Apogee to the next level. So I have launched the official Apogee website and shop, where you can find all new Apogee designed posters, stickers, and apparel, such as this commercial crew yin yang poster that celebrates the harmony of Crew Dragon and Starliner. I'm also excited to announce my Patreon. If you like the channel, please consider becoming a supporter. You'll gain access to exclusive content such as live streams and become a flight crew member in the official Apogee Discord channel. I wanted to keep this Discord open to everyone, so even if you aren't a patron, be sure to join in on the discussion. So to wrap up, Apogee now has an official website with cool space merch, a Patreon page where you can support what I do and gain exclusive benefits, and a Discord server open to all. Links in the description. I'm going to start off by going over the things I like about Blue Origin, and some of the things I think they may be overly criticized for. On a personal and somewhat superficial level, I have always loved their brand. The name, the logo, naming schemes for the rockets. New Glenn has always been my favorite rocket design from an aesthetics perspective. I also personally prefer their vision of millions living and working in cislunar space, in large free space colonies such as O'Neill cylinders, more than I like SpaceX's goal of settling Mars. Don't get me wrong, both are really important and they're not mutually exclusive goals, we should pursue both. I'm not against settling on Mars, it's just I feel that free space colonies are more conducive to human life and that settling space near Earth will be more impactful for our species, especially short term. Anyways, that's not what this video is about, but subscribe if you want to see my full thoughts on that subject in an upcoming video. I also think Blue Origin should get a lot of credit for understanding from the beginning that reuse is essential to lowering the cost of access to space. They didn't beat around the bush with paper thin anti-reuse talking points or just come around to accepting reuse 10 years too late. Now, that's a lot of the things I like about Blue Origin. I also want to address one criticism they often get which I don't think is fair. You probably already know the one because it's impossible to have a conversation about Blue Origin without this being brought up. They haven't even gotten to orbit. 
you hear it all the time, SpaceX was founded after Blue Origin and got to orbit over 10 years ago and Blue still hasn't made it. This criticism just doesn't make any sense to me. In the early years, Blue Origin was really just a space think tank. They then decided to make a suborbital tourism vehicle as their first rocket. It's not like they've been trying and failing to reach orbit for 20 years. They've been doing something else. This would be like criticizing an NFL running back for not having many passing yards. Now, if you want to argue that New Glenn should have been ready earlier or that they should have never built a suborbital vehicle, that's a totally different criticism. But to just say that they haven't reached orbit isn't really valid in my opinion. Speaking of valid criticism, it's time to talk about what has gone wrong. I think the best way to approach this section is to start by simply listing the troubles they've encountered and take a look at how they reacted to them. And then I want to go over my single biggest concern with Blue Origin. Next, I'll try to uncover what I think is the cause of these troubles. And finally, I'll wrap it up by suggesting some potential solutions. I'm going to do my best to list these hardships in order. They bid on Commercial Crew back in 2010 and worked on it with NASA until 2011 when they decided to leave the program. The reasoning seems to be that they had a long-term vision and decided this competition wasn't worth it for them. However, as reported by Jeff Faust, when Jeff Bezos found out that the program provided SpaceX with billions of dollars, he reportedly asked, why did we decide not to bid on that? So next up, they ended up bidding on the National Security Space Launch Phase 2 competition with their new Glenn rocket. This is a big and important award. Basically, the Air Force buys several defense payload launches for the next five years, and they choose two providers that get these high value launches. Blue Origin, Northrop Grumman, SpaceX, and ULA all bid for the award, with SpaceX and ULA winning in the end. How did they react to this loss? Seven months later, Blue Origin announced a two-year delay of the New Glenn rocket. The vice president of the New Glenn program, Jarrett Jones, blamed this delay on losing the NSSL award, stating that it was a big hit for us and we had to consider the economics. This just makes no sense. For one thing, they have other customers waiting on New Glenn, such as Telesat, as well as their own payloads like Amazon's Internet Constellation and the National Team Lander. Second off, they don't need money. Sure, it's nice to have, but they're owned by the richest man on Earth, and they were self-funding New Glenn regardless. They initially weren't even going to bid on the NSSL competition because they had a handshake agreement with ULA that if they were chosen as the provider of the engines for Vulcan, they wouldn't compete with ULA on these military payloads. They then changed their mind and went against their word, which led to some bad blood between the companies, I guess until ULA won the contract. Now just imagine for a second if Starship lost some Air Force contract, and SpaceX came out seven months later saying, oh, we need to delay Starship for two years. The mentality of that is just sad to be honest, but what makes it worse is that it's just not true. We all know the real reason New Glenn is delayed is because space is very hard, and when you're trying to build a huge reusable rocket for the first time, delays are gonna happen. Why lie about this? More recently, we have the HLS competition, where Blue Origin led the national team, a lander of the combined efforts from Blue Origin, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and Draper. Everyone was positive that this team would be unbeatable, and yet the SpaceX Starship ended up winning the contract. Now, how did Blue Origin react to this loss? Well, they did a few things. The first was protesting the award, which is a completely normal response and these things happen all the time. What's not normal is some of the content of the protest. They claim that NASA only gave SpaceX the opportunity to modify their pricing in some sort of backroom deal. 
what actually happened as laid out by NASA in the source selection statement is that NASA approached SpaceX with the award for the lander due to them being the highest rated bidder and then negotiated the payment for the award with SpaceX. Now, due to the underfunding of HLS, NASA had no money remaining to approach Blue Origin and their second place lander after they had already given the money to SpaceX. To try and frame this as some sort of shady action by NASA is just lying and it's a very poor look for Blue Origin. After submitting the protest, Blue got the senator from their district to add an amendment to a recent bill that would mandate NASA choosing a second HLS lander. Now there's a lot of confusion surrounding this bill. A lot of people have read this amendment as saying NASA must choose a second HLS lander and we're going to give NASA 10 billion extra dollars over the next five years to pay for it. Now sure, having your senator step in and force NASA to choose your lander is kind of lame, but NASA wanted more HLS money and a second lander, so overall this would be great, right? Well, it would be great, and almost everyone in the space community would support that amendment, if that's what the amendment said, but it doesn't. What it actually does is two things. It mandates NASA choose a second lander, but it only authorizes the extra money to potentially be appropriated. If that difference seems minimal, let me put it this way. I now authorize Bill Gates to give you each $1 billion. Notice how you didn't just become a billionaire? That's the difference between authorizing money and appropriating money. Now, this bill has passed, so NASA is stuck with what is known as an unfunded mandate, something Congress loves to do with NASA, which is basically tell them they must do something, but not give them any money to do it. The scenario that those who oppose this amendment fear is that NASA doesn't get extra HLS money and is left with a mandate to choose a second HLS provider when they can barely even afford the first one. Oh, and by the way, that second provider is twice as expensive. What happens then is NASA must stretch the payment timelines out, delaying the Artemis program. Best case scenario, NASA is able to get more money for HLS and we avoid that fate. The most recent misfortune to befall Blue was the announcement that Amazon has bought nine Atlas V launches for their low Earth orbit Kuiper internet constellation. The reason this was news is because Jeff Bezos, of course, owns Amazon and Blue Origin. It's no secret that Blue Origin would have been the preferred ride for these satellites, but due to the delays, Amazon had to go with a competitor. So as you can tell, setbacks have been a dime a dozen. Later I'll try to explore what may be the cause, but first I have to lay out my single greatest concern about Blue Origin the New Shepard program. And it's not the reason that a lot of people harp on. As I said before, I don't agree with the whole suborbital criticism. A lot of people also deride New Shepard as pointless, and I completely disagree. I think New Shepard is the perfect first project for Blue. You're a young company, you need to build knowledge and experience. New Shepard is a program you can learn a lot from because it is way more ambitious than people give it credit for. This is a rocket that is 100% reusable. The booster and capsule both land. It's also designed from the outset to carry humans, which is a huge undertaking. Learning how to design for human spaceflight is a crucial step in the vision of people living and working in space, so I love that. On a personal note, this is a rocket that I would have zero qualms about hopping on board. Blue Origin has put it through the ringer with a wide envelope of validation tests. Sure, it doesn't go to orbit, but again, this was a choice. Just look at it next to Rocket Lab's Orbital Electron Rocket. New Shepard is no joke. Learning how to design, build, launch, land, refurbish, and refly rockets in addition to gaining human spaceflight experience in your very first program is amazing in my opinion. 
Also, it should be noted that this is the one thing they have accomplished. BE4 and New Glenn have suffered long delays, and you've seen the myriad of competitions lost, but they got New Shepard up and operating. So, if the program has all these positives, and I think it's awesome, then why is it my biggest concern about Blue Origin? Well, the first flight was in 2015, six years ago. We know now that the validation program was 15 launches. Why on earth did it take six years to fly this tiny, fully reusable suborbital rocket 15 times? I just don't care what excuse you can come up with, this pace is unjustifiable. This is not vehicle delay, Blue Origin has been launching and even reusing this vehicle since the very beginning. This is the one program they actually have up and running, and this is the pace we get? Where is the ferocity? Let's look at this next to SpaceX's pace to put it in perspective. Now keep in mind, these vehicles are hardly even comparable in terms of scale and capability. The image of a Falcon 9 next to the New Shepard should make it clear. The Falcon 9 is a medium class orbital launch vehicle with two stages and 10 engine compared to the New Shepard's single stage and engine. The New Shepard does a simple straight up and down suborbital flight, which is fine but the Falcon 9's first stage does much more demanding profiles at far greater speeds. Just look at the flight profiles side by side. And this, the return to launch site or RTLS profile, is actually the easiest one Falcon 9 does. More often, the Falcon 9 performs a drone ship landing about 600 kilometers out in the Atlantic Ocean, exaggerating the difference even further. But by far, the most important difference when we compare cadence has to be that, unlike the new Shepard, Falcon 9 is not fully reusable. It throws away an entire second stage and engine every flight, and only very recently have they began recovering the fairings with marginal success. The second stage of Falcon 9 alone is larger than the entire new Shepard vehicle. So for every Falcon 9 flight you're about to see, SpaceX was building and losing a rocket stage bigger than New Shepard. So let's get started. Blue Origin launched New Shepard twice in 2015, four times in 2016, just once in 2017, two times in 2018, three more times the following year, just once in 2020, and then so far this year there have been two flights with the next one scheduled in just a few days. This gives us the 15 total flights. Now let's look at SpaceX's Falcon family over the same span of years. In 2015, Falcon 9 flew seven times. 2016 saw nine launches. There were 18 the next year and 21 in 2018, including the maiden flight of Falcon Heavy. 2019 had 13 total launches and there were 26 launches in 2020. That's a flight every two weeks. This year alone, SpaceX has flown 17 times. The difference should be pretty obvious, but put it this way. In the last five months, SpaceX has launched Falcon 9 more than New Shepard has flown in the past six years. So I think it's clear how horrendous this pace has been, but hey, maybe now that they're about to start flying people, it'll pick up, right? Well, apparently not. During the press run for the first human flight, Ariane Cornell from Blue Origin told The Verge that they plan to do, quote, a couple more flights in 2021. A couple. So the reason New Shepard concerns me so much is it's the one program that Blue Origin has successfully had operational for over five years at this point. What does this kind of pace that we've seen mean for their other programs when they finally come online? Where will New Glenn be five years after its first launch? 
or their lunar lander and so on. New Shepard is the only program we have to base our expectation for this company off of, and that is deeply concerning. Hopefully the New Shepard program isn't a canary in the coal mine for the future of this company. Alright, so now that that's off my chest, what do I think may be the underlying issues that have caused so much hardship for Blue? Well, first is the lack of urgency, made painfully clear by my breakdown of New Shepard. As I said, there is really no excuse for this pace. It's not like it's stuck in development delays, it's been complete for a while. This fact leads me to believe that delays we've seen in other programs, such as BE4 and New Glenn, aren't 100% caused by development issues. Blue Origin just doesn't seem to be in a rush to do anything, frankly. Now this alone isn't inherently negative. There is something to be said for allowing things to take their time and going at your own pace. But I think this leisurely pace has some cascading effects. Take New Shepard for example. What if they had completed the 15 flight test campaign in 3 years? That's only 5 flights per year of very achievable cadence. All of a sudden, Blue Origin is a company that has flown humans to space in 2018, and likely could have flown close to 50 people by 2021. Or let's look at New Glenn. The slow development has had a cascading effect. Because of the lack of progress, they end up losing the NSSL contract. Their bid for HLS also suffered. Originally, the Blue Origin descent element was designed to take advantage of New Glenn's massive 7 meter fairing. Because of delays, they had to redesign the element to fit inside of ULA's 5 meter fairing. This redesign likely aided into schedule, and it also made the lander very tall and perhaps even less capable. Would the HLS decision have been different in this timeline? I don't know if this would have been enough to beat Starship, but it couldn't hurt. What confuses me is that Blue always seems very surprised when they miss out on an award. Oh, we need to delay New Glenn because we lost the NSSL. Oh, we lost HLS, it must be because NASA was being unfair to us. As I said, if your development philosophy is let's go slow and take our time, that's perfectly fine. But don't be shocked when you begin losing to competitors that have been working at a faster pace and racking up more achievements and experience. The tortoise can only let the hare get so far ahead before the race is just over. I think the evidence points to management being the source of this slow and steady approach. After all, Blue Origin's CEO is from Honeywell Aerospace. A defense contractor, and many of their engineers are SpaceX veterans. It is evident at this point that Blue Origin develops technology in a waterfall methodology, meaning non-iterative. Take New Shepard for example. It hasn't really changed since its first flight. Falcon 9 on the other hand has switched to a super chilled propellant, has a different engine arrangement, the engines have doubled in thrust, the tanks have been stretched, They've added landing legs and grid fins and the ability to be reused, and they human rated it and redesigned the fairings to be reused. Blue Origin has said they want New Glenn to land on the first mission. Why? What, what does this accomplish for them? This is why after six years since the public announcement, the only hardware we have seen for New Glenn, besides the engines, is a Pathfinder fairing half and about a quarter of a Pathfinder for the first stage. But they've already finished the factory and launch pad. SpaceX, for example, started building Starship out of a tent and have built the factory around it. The easiest change Blue Origin could make to right the ship is to ditch this perfect everything before we touch a piece of metal mentality and adopt an iterative, minimum viable product, test while you fly approach. The next change I would suggest is to modify your vision. Millions of people working and living in space is awesome, but it's pretty vague. There are many ways to achieve this. Choose a more specific goal that all your near-term decisions can be based on. For example, we want to build a rotating space station with artificial gravity. 
Now, all of your vehicles and decisions can be designed with that station in mind. How much payload do we need? How big of a fairing? What kind of launch cadence? These all become defined by such a goal, the same way the requirements of landing on Mars has shaped Starship. Now, this is a YouTube video after all, so we mustn't be afraid to dream a little bigger. What does Blue Origin have? Experience? No. Customers? Not many. Contracts? Not really. What do they have? Money. Money can buy you all of these things. Want experience and legacy? Buy it. Want contracts and customers? Buy them. Here's a crazy idea that could transform Blue Origin overnight. Purchase ULA. Now, move past the initial reaction. What does this get you? You've gone from a company with no orbital missions to one that has completed 144 successfully. Instead of leaping from a tiny suborbital rocket to one of the largest vehicles ever made, you're now a company with decades of experience with mid to heavy lift vehicles. Instead of your next generation rocket coming out in 2024, you have Vulcan coming out early next year, relieving some of that pressure. And it makes a lot of sense, Vulcan uses Blue Origin engines after all. You've now gone from losing the NSSL contest to winning it. You now have contracts for 60% of national security payloads over the next five years. Amazon's Constellation is now launching on Blue Origin rockets. Assuming the next Starliner mission goes well, you now have orbital human spaceflight capabilities and soon the prestige of flying humans to the International Space Station. And finally, you get Tori Bruno, unleashed from Boeing and Lockheed to replace Bob Smith. This is all easier said than done, of course. Lockheed and Boeing may not be willing to sell ULA. In 2015, Aerojet Rocketdyne offered to buy ULA for $2 billion, which was considered a high offer, but ULA still rejected it. At the end of the day, money talks, and Jeff Bezos has got the money. All right, that does it for my opinion on Blue Origin as of 2021. My final thoughts on the subject are really just this. I believe Blue Origin can be wildly successful and we should all want them to be. I don't want this video to be taken as diminishing any of the incredible achievements their engineers have made. Anyone who cares about spaceflight should want to see Blue Origin be successful because we need as much innovation, competition, and cooperation as possible. The more players, the better. But as an opinion and analysis channel, I want to share my honest assessments, and that may not always be positive. Criticism is often associated with malice. Don't let it be. We can criticize things that we love in order to help improve them. Blue Origin has the talent, resources, and vision to be great.